Welcome to Gung Ho. My name is Matt Hindra. I'm, I'm filling in for Joe Giannini. And here uh, today we're talking with uh, Terry Sullivan. So why don't you talk a little bit about your relationship with Pete Seeger? Well, Pete, when I first met Pete, uh, I was at, um, there's a book over there, and it's um, about the favorite songs of the lesser known people of the civil rights era, right? And what we were gonna do was uh, with Pete and Issei Barnwell, who is the lady who sings bass in Sweet Honey in the Rock. Mm. Have you ever heard them? No. If you wanna see, hear amazing voices, all five of these ladies could be divas at the Met and they sing a acapella, acapella political songs. And they're just amazing. And uh, Issei Barnwell is the bass, and uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, who is, uh, has a doctorate in history and is the head of the African American section of the Smithsonian. Mm. And she started um, Sweet Honey in the Rock. Yeah, look them up. They're they're amazing voices, just all a cappella, and every once in a while a drum like this in a in a calabash chord or something. But basically, so um, this workshop was a week long workshop at Omega Institute, which is upstate. And so it was Pete and um, Issei, and so what we were doing was we were singing the songs of the civil rights movement and writing our own. I had this great week with Pete and uh, Issei, and uh, at the end of it, it was um, about a 50, yeah, about a 50 foot round building that we were singing in. And everyone at the end of it, they were just kind of drifting away and there wasn't like a end to the workshop. So Pete was standing there and he had just um, said goodbye to people and um, I walked up to him and I said, Pete, let's sing so long it's been good to know you. And he said, well, you got the voice and I got the banjo, let's do it. And so at first um, pe people didn't uh, realize what we were doing and then he started playing the chords and everyone, oh, I know what that is. So long, so long. So the, the workshop had an end to it. It was a, you know, so Pete sat down and um, he said, um, well, what do you do down there um, in New York City? And I said, well, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying to organize this small chorus, like 12 people, but a chorus to, um, imitate the, the um, people in New York, an interracial chorus. And he looks at me and he says, well, you're just the fellow I've been looking for. And I look behind me to see who he's talking to. And he said, I want to do the same thing, but I want to do, uh, now I'm talking about 12 people. And, he's, and Pete says, uh, but, I want to make a course about two, three hundred, maybe. I said, well, you can do that because you're Pete Seeger. I'd like you to talk about why you started writing these stories. Um, I started um, with stories about my childhood. I was a rebel. I was the black sheep of my family. And um, my Brother Richard, when I was about 40, reminded me of this incident where I'm a wise guy. And we used to sit, seven kids, in a semicircle. 
Now, this is a Levitt-built house in Hicksville, and it had a TV built into the wall. Stairs go up here, and that wall, there was a TV built into that wall. So we'd all sit in a semicircle watching the TV with my father behind us in a recliner. So I said some smart-ass remark His Holiness didn't like, and... Um, Terrence, go to bed. Then I made another wise remark as I'm getting up. And blah, 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 you know, my brothers and sisters are all, you know, Terrence. And I hear the, <laughs> the recliner going down. So I run to the stairs and he catches me. And with a I'm about eight years old. This guy's 220 pounds, about 6'2". And he punches me. And I put my hands up like Floyd Patterson, the, the peekaboo. And I said, I don't care how much you hit me. I'm not crying anymore. As if. <laughs> well, he hit me a few more times. And that was no fun. Yeah, that doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, so I was, there's just to point out that yeah. um, I was a rebel, you know, from the time I was like, you know, right. four or five. So you started. You started really writing for your for to just yeah just to and, and tell these stories. stories. I, I guess the reason why I'm asking is is yeah. we've we've met a lot of veterans who write mm. be, for just to sort of either try to put, figure it out. Yeah, figure it out. Put what was in in their head on paper and maybe get it out of their head. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, are these realistic statements? I'm saying about oh, your yeah. work too. Well, you see, the thing is, when I was um, in grammar school, I was doing things that I was the only kid doing them, like hitting back nuns. <laughs> I mean, the nuns would get carried away, and they loved to hit kids. And I'd, I'd just, like, give them a backhand every once in a while. So I had a reputation as a wild kid. All right, so now you're going to tell another story. We've got enough time on that card for... 20 minute story? Minutes. Good. We in the water, we in the water, children, we in the water. I'm gonna trouble the water. I was in the army in 1966. I'm gonna trouble the water. I was in a situation that I could not fix. I was gonna trouble the water. We. Chapter nine, blanket party. When you entered the US Army boot camp in 1966, they shaved your head so thoroughly, you'd have thought they were making money off the hair that they shaved off your head. And they, the purpose of this initi initiation ritual was to make you all look the same, give you the illusion that in the eyes of the army, you were all the same. So, all y'all had better get with the program and act like you were all the same. Well, I was not born to conform. So I asked the sergeant if I, when I could grow back my beloved mustache. And he said, with a straight face, I'm sure they'll let you grow that back after you graduate from boot camp. Fair enough. I'll have a bald upper lip for eight weeks. As soon as we arrived in advanced individual training after graduating from boot camp, we had an orientation where I posed this question in front of my fellow 2,700 trainees. Sergeant Major, I was told in basic training when I got to AIT, I could grow my mustache back. 
the sergeant replied, all y'all listen up. I'm going to say this once, so you better not ask about it again. The face you have on your ID card will be the face you will present for the rest of your stay in this man's army, period. Son of a bitch, they lied to me. I blurted out to no one. Within minutes, I remembered the moment. They took the picture of my face for that ID card. It was a Polaroid. That meant that tiny pol that Polaroid on my laminated plastic card was the only copy. There's no negative in a Polaroid process. If I were to lose that card, there would be no card to compare my face to. Luckily, a week later, they gave us a two-week Christmas leave. And I spent that two weeks growing a mustache and carelessly leaving my ID card on my dresser at home. Now, you've already heard the day-long story where I end up with a government-approved mustache. Some of my fellow soldiers were pissed off that I fought for and won the right to be the only one in 2,700 trustees with a mustache, approved by the commanding officer. A small group of creeps in my barracks decided I needed a blanket party for being a nonconformist. Let's define blanket party for the uninitiated. It starts with a group sympathetic to the Army's mission of blind obedience. It then adds corporal punishment for those who step out of line or don't conform. It takes two to tango, so when the offending party steps out of line, the enforcers of blind obedience feel the need to beat the crap out of the person who refuses to get with the program. Now, this violent reinforcing of conforming to norms is silently sanctioned by the powers that be because they have been forced by lawsuits to write protections against corporal punishment in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Moreover, this unchecked violence is more dangerous in direct proportion to what your company commander might allow or ignore. I had my new mustache about four weeks when I heard there was rumors that someone had planned a blanket party in my honor. Well, at least I was going to be the center of attention. My best friends happened to bunk right below me and next to me. We made up the outcast corner of the barracks. Bill Davis, white guitar player from Beeville, Texas, and my two black, unindicted co-conspirators, Walter Gray from Detroit, and last but not least, my main man, Ronnie Eastman from Roxbury, Mass. All four of us weird musketeers used to harmonize in our leisure hours. This was a training outfit for medics. It was far more relaxed than most training units, but there was one goon named Politis from East St. Louis, and he and a crew of racist creeps did not like Davis and I socializing with the black troops, especially singing together. It wasn't natural or some such madness. I was alone in a latrine one night when three of the creeps came in and one of them said, Hey, Bob, which is worse, negras or negra lovers? There was only white boys in there, including me, who it was obviously aimed at. Outnumbered, I quickly brushed by them and slipped away from the confrontation, singing. Weed in the water, weed in the water, children, weed in the water. I'm going to trouble the water. They froze in their tracks long enough for me to get away. Their blanket party secret was leaked. And all for one and one for all was our battle call. What was remarkable was how lame their excuse for their blanket party was. The 15 minutes the platoon had to wait while Sergeant Coulter failed to persuade me to shave my mustache. 
shaving it would have taken longer. It was the mustache. On the, oh, on the empty ground floor of the barracks, I found four two-foot-long steel pipes. These are the couplings that you put bunks together with. This goes on, the, and this goes on the, the uh, foot of the other one. And uh, all four of us, mu we are musketeers in the, in the misfit corner. We tucked them under our pillows. Next to us were our steel pots, which is the Army issue helmet. We were tipped off by James Eddy. Now, James was stranger than all of the weird musketeers together, but he was passing as normal because he had his own plans for leaving the army and the country if they gave him orders to now. He was so convincing at this normal role, they told him about the blanket party. <laughs> It was scheduled for a little after lights out. Now, I'm usually asleep a little, little after lights out, and the goons have learned this from Fred Friend, a goon who bunked across from me. So I was faking snoring, and Gray was on the top bunk next to mine with his one eye peeking over his folded pillow, just slightly open. Friend became convinced I was asleep and gave them the signal to proceed. There were six of them, sliding down the well-polished floor, tiptoeing to my bed with two blankets, along the wide aisle between the bunks in the middle of the barracks, with only the light from the latrine about 60 feet away, casting long shadows and backlit figures with politis heading up the goon squad. They're whispering to each other, sliding along the well-waxed floor. You could hear them breathing, my pulses thumping, and my throat and my temple. My mouth was flannel dry. They were about 10 feet away when I rolled off the top bunk screaming at the top of my lungs. Goons, you fucking goons. You want some of me? Come on, you looking for me? All four of us weird musketeers stood next to my bunk, steel pipes in hand, steel pots in the other, at the other end of the barracks, James Eddy flicked on all the lights as he banged on the sergeant's door. The sudden flood of fluorescent light made this low light scene turn stark and awkward when fully lit, but still tense as no one is moving until the sergeant comes flying out of his room. Nobody has moved forward towards the intended victim because the odds aren't so good against someone who can defend themselves. Their mouths moved in vague threats that are broken off by the approach of Sergeant Coulter. What the hell's going on? What are you supposed to be? A Mickey Mouse lynch mom? Well, Sergeant, shut up. Get back in your bunks. I got the Sergeant attention, I asked. Do I have to press charges, Sergeant, to get some security around here? Sullivan, in my office. I plopped my equipment on the bunk and said to Ronnie, keep an eye on that, will you, Ronnie? I'll be right back. Morons. Can't even pull off a blanket party. The sergeant muttered to himself, but loud enough for the goon party to hear. As we walked into the sergeant's office, I said, I'm sorry, Sarge, but I got to defend myself. I mean, I don't mean to cause trouble, but I'll fuck these guys up if they come after me. Shut up, Sullivan. Nobody's coming after you. Not after what I just saw, but you can do yourself a favor and save everybody here a lot of grief by not pressing charges. I'll let these morons know Number one, they blew it, and they can get a courts martial. And two, you're not pressing charges is a favor they owe you, and it can be rescinded anytime you please. Now, you've caused enough chaos in one week for a platoon of privates. Get to bed. Sarge, nothing. Get to bed. Just thank you. Get the fuck out of here. You're welcome. I walked down the middle of the aisle. There wasn't a peep out of anyone as I sang quietly to myself. We in the water, we in the water, children, we. I was fairly certain the sergeant was right. Nobody was coming near me to start a blanket party, but the four musketeers, we were gonna hold on to our equipment because this was an uneasy piece. The goons had really blown it showing their intention to physically harm another soldier 
in the presence of Sergeant Coulter, who is a non-commissioned officer, sworn to uphold the UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And there was a room full of privates who were witnesses, who were not friends of the goons. The goons had shown their hand, and now a courts martial for them was my ace in the hole. So that's the story, and here's a PS for it, uh, kind of a, an overview of the now 74-year-old me. It never ceases to amaze me how people will enforce the normal behavior accepted by a dominant group by ostracizing those who don't conform, even resorting to violence to keep people in line who don't agree with them. Allies of these outsider groups come in for some special treatment as they are considered traitors. Those enforcing these norms fall for the illusion fostered on them by those in power, that they are better than the group's branded outsiders, even though by any rational criteria, they have more in common than not with these targets. To stay in power, these leaders work to divide and conquer with mythologies and scare tactics, portraying the outsiders as animals like chimps, no matter what you're thinking of, the image that I have in mind is in the 1800s, the infamous cartoonist Thomas Nast depicted Irish as monkeys, wearing Irish outfits and Irish clay pipes in their gobs. These goons in the army barracks, they're falling for all the stereotypes they had heard about Negroes and their allies, Negro lovers. You could call this unconstitutional in that they were abridging our First Amendment right to peacefully assemble. My mom would say, don't make a federal case out of it. We in the water, we in the water, children, we in the water, I'm gonna trouble the water. They could not see this is my civil rights. I'm gonna trouble the water. Now I see it as a lifelong fight. I'm still gonna trouble that water. We. If you were to know that someone was watching mm -hmm. and what you, what you would say to that person uh, regarding the current military and how they should treat soldiers, I mean, I'm assuming the military will never go away. Yeah. Um, there so, should be room for any type of personality in the Army. And the end of... One of my stories is um, when I first got drafted, you know, I tried, like I said, to get conscientious objective. And um, at the end of the story, I get out of the Army eight months early. Why? Because I'm unfit for military life. That's what I told you when you drafted me. You're finally waking up, you know. and. That, that's basically, when you have a black sheep, you know, a rebel, it's not going to be it. No matter what the army is, it's not going to be a, a good fit. Put them in something like the Peace Corps, you know, where there, there's flexibility. And you can, you know, say this is um, the, the aim of what we're doing, not blind obedience. Because I already knew from Catholic school that didn't work out. Blind obedience is not a program. So what? What exact? What was the incident that led to your imprisonment? <laughs> what was the last straw with the army? What was the last straw? Or was it an accumulation of things over a year's period? Oh yeah. Um, 
I, uh, I went AWOL. I decided that um, I had two weeks leave. I said, oh, that's not enough. I need to relax some more. So I added another um, week to it. And my company commander, <laughs> his name was Bernard A. Johnson. And he used to say, he was a little guy, he was about 5'7", five, 5'8", five, at most. And he was a medical officer, but he always wore fatigues. And it's like a little compensating thing now. We didn't buy it. He said his name was B.A. His initials were B.A. and that stood for badass. Oh, really? <laughs> you want to go out behind the school and duke it out? You know, really stupid hollow macho stuff. And uh, so I called him up and I said, you can get anything you want at Alice's restaurant. Says, what the hell? I said, well, I just thought you might, it's a, it's a new song. I thought you might know it, Colonel. Um, what I want to do is I want to come in and talk about you throwing me out of the Army because I'm just a waste of time, you know? I'm just a waste of time and energy for the Army and, you know, just taking up space. So I'm already you know, three weeks out, I'm just, you know, only one week AWOL, and I don't want to go any further, because that's desertion. So, he agreed to talk, and I came in, and um, as I walked in the door, and he saw that I had grown a goatee for those three weeks, he said, and he had two guards waiting to take me to the stockade. Are they now? Used to be a wall.